Hello, I'm El Paso County Commissioner Dennis Heisey. As a result of last year's devastating Waldo Canyon fire, our community now faces a serious threat from flash flooding. But there's a lot you can do to protect yourself. County and city websites, weather radios, community meetings, and local media all provide information to help you know your risk, stay informed, and make a plan. It'll take years to heal the burn scar, and emergency preparedness starts with you. From maintenance of county roads to the administration of criminal justice, from determining the taxable value of real property to controlling the spread of infectious diseases, from protecting children and the elderly to marriage licenses and motor vehicle transactions, from keeping the peace to protecting our environment and making sure that your vote counts, El Paso County government is working for you. Welcome to El Paso County Works. This program is produced by the El Paso County Public Information Office to inform citizens about the programs and services of Colorado's most populous county. Um, I'm Dave Rose. I'm the El Paso County Public Information Officer, and I'm just going to uh, kind of act as an MC and get things going today. Uh, we have a, the folks who actually know what they're talking about in the room today, and we have a lot of them. Uh, Steve Sanchez is over there from the uh, Forest Service, Andre Bracken from our County Engineering Office. Um, I saw Tim Mitros from uh, City Engineering, Ken Hewlett, and, uh, Brett Waters. They'll all be available to answer your questions later on. Uh, just a few weeks after the Waldo Canyon fire was brought under control, a typical summer rainstorm fell over the burn scar. It triggered a mudslide that resulted in westbound Highway 24 being closed at Green Mountain Falls and destroyed an important Colorado Springs utility water transmission well, pipeline this this. just west of the Air Force Academy. It did millions of dollars worth of damage. This was our first experience with the new reality that west and northwest Colorado Springs, Ute Pass, and Manitou must now live with a much greater risk of flash flooding than ever before and that that heightened risk will likely be with us for many years to come. The purpose of today's news conference is to release the preliminary findings of the matrix design analysis of flood risk. This report was commissioned by the El Paso County and City of Colorado Springs Emergency Management Offices to help them better identify the homes, businesses, and critical transportation infrastructure, as well as utilities infrastructure, which are now at the greatest risk of damage from flash flooding. Think of it this way. Where will the water go? How fast will it be moving? What damage will it do? What can be done to reduce the risk? And how can we best as individuals be prepared to respond? I especially want to thank all of you in the media who are here today. You're doing a great job of helping our citizens understand the risk so that they can make personal plans to ensure the best possible outcomes. As you continue to write and produce stories on the risk of flash flooding, we hope that you will join us and use the term flash flooding rather than just flooding. Because we have found, with our partners from the El Paso County Health Department and going door to door, that when residents from the Midwest and South and East Coast hear the term flooding, they picture the Mississippi River slowly rising over a period of days. The sandbag crews come out to shore up the levees, and there's lots of time to evacuate. What we know for sure is that won't happen here. The waters will come quickly, the damage will be done in a short period of time, and it will not be a Mississippi River type of flood. With that, let me bring up El Paso County Commissioner Sally Clark, Commissioner Clark represents the third commissioner district, the Burn Star, the neighborhoods burned and the Waldo Canyon fire and the biggest risk of flash flooding are all in her commissioner district. Commissioner Clark, I'm going to give you this microphone. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming today. Um, since the, the July 30th flash flood event uh, last year, a regional fire recovery working group consisting of representatives from the county, the city, um, the U.S. Forest Service, the Coalition for the Upper South Flat, also known as CUSP, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, 
Colorado Springs Department of Transportation, City of Colorado Springs, uh, City of Manitou Springs, Colorado Springs Utilities, and many others have been participating with our regional recovery efforts to coordinate and mitigate the risk of fire, uh, fire flooding as a result of the fire and preparation for response. Um, Brett Waters from the Colorado Springs Office of Emergency Management and I have been co-chairing this group and it's been an outstanding collaboration. And I also wanted to mention that we've been collaborating with the folks from Larimer County up north who, who dealt with the Hyde Park fire last year in addition to Boulder County that's been very supportive. Um, they had um, witnessed a lot the fires previously a few years ago and most recently we were just um, I was in Coconino County Arizona to discuss the Schultz fire and what the the supervisors in in uh, Coconino County which is near Flagstaff have been working on lessons learned from that and we hope to continue that collaborative effort but through the efforts also of our con Colorado congressional delegation, our senators and our congressmen, uh, both from Larimer and El Paso counties, uh, the Colorado Office of Emergency Management and others have provided additional funding to do this mitigation and this inundation study that you're going to hear about today. Volunteers in the direction for the Coalition for the Upper South Platte, private and landowners like Glen Airy and the Flying W Ranch have also joined in with our Colorado Department of Transportation, the Colorado Springs Utilities, El Paso County, Manitou, the U.S. Forest Service, and the City of Colorado Springs in completing a number of mitigation projects and many more are planned. The Matrix Design Study, which was funded by the county, the city, and others, and you'll hear the long list as others speak, will further help us direct every single dollar spent on mitigation to make sure it's spent on the most effective manner but even more importantly, it will help guide our planning for emergency response. And it will guide our citizens in making those personal preparations and decisions and plans that will work for their families during a flash flood event. And as Dave mentioned, we're talking about flash flooding. So it's very important to note that these things happen very quickly and not necessarily the rain will come in your particular area of where the flooding will occur but it will start in the burn scar area uphill. It's important to keep in mind though that this is a preliminary report and that the final report will be completed in July. It's also important to note that this is an analysis and compilation of the best data that we have available today. It will help emergency managers, engineers, and citizens to make informed decisions based on likely scenarios. So they are basically in general showing where the water may go we don't know depending on the weather patterns exactly where it will happen um, but this will give a good indication of where you need to be on guard if you're a citizen or business owner in the area that may be impacted it's really a valuable tool but there's no way to perfectly predict the impacts of a heavy rain over the burn scar and will depend upon many to keep us really informed as the weather patterns develop where folks need to be not only aware but where they'll need to put their plans into place as uh, rain and storm events happen. So I wanted to thank all of the community partners and the agencies here today and echo Dave's remarks in thanking all of you from the media from the beginning of the fire I know you were all there along the way and we're not done with this yet it's going to be a long recovery it's 10 years since the Heyman fire, but the Heyman didn't, didn't have the area that we're looking at with such a um, consistently compact area where there's an urban interface involved and, and businesses along the way as well. So we appreciate you getting the word out. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Patty Baxter from the El Paso County uh, Sheriff's Office and Office of Emergency Management to give you a little bit more details on the study itself. But again, thank you all for coming today. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone's prepared and that individuals are taking the responsibility that they need to be prepared. And hopefully they won't need to, but you just never know. And this is just taking, I think, an important step forward in uh, preparedness and making sure that we disclose information. We need to make sure that we're um, 
really making sure that we communicate with our citizens on how important it is to be prepared. Patty? Thank you and, and welcome. The uh, Walden Canyon burn scar, as we all know, has created a new environment, uh, a new threat of flash flooding that, although July 30th of last year gave us a flavor, um, it, it was just a, a small example of what the burn scar could produce. After the fire was contained, the bear team came in and did an extensive study, and we knew how much estimates of how much water and how much debris would come out of the canyons. In some cases, hundreds, 1,500 cubic feet of water and hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of debris. And what we did not know is when it came out of the burn scar, it came through the core point. Where would that debris go? Where would that water go? Uh, the intent of this study was hopefully to help us answer some of those questions. Uh, we established a working group, and the members of the working group was El Paso County Sheriff's Office, Office of Emergency Management, El Paso County, City of Colorado Springs, Colorado Springs Utilities, Regional Building, Colorado Department of Emergency Management, Colorado Water Conservation Board, and the Town of Manitou Springs. Um, after some significant work, we uh, were able to establish a contract with Matrix Design Group to produce two products. The first of which you are going to see today. And the first product is a rough cut uh, map of the inundation area uh, from the burn scar. The second product, which will be available sometime the end of July and early August, will be a more detailed study. Uh, we have found that you can produce something fast, but not at great detail, and, or you can spend a lot more time to get it right. We tried to do both. We tried to do a rough cut um, with some assumptions that you'll see as a disclaimer on the map, but I'll also go over those in a minute. Uh, to get something to the public quickly, to get something in emergency management's hands quickly so we can plan and so can residents. The second more detailed study, uh, will the matrix will go in, we'll do a lot more analysis, a lot more modeling, and end of August, or, I'm sorry, end of July, early August, you will see another set of maps. And those maps will cover uh, the inundation area at half inch of rain in an hour, one inch, one and a half, one and three quarters, two inches and two and a half inches of rain all in one hour. Some residents may find that with a half inch or an inch of rain, they are perfectly safe to stay in their homes during flooding conditions, but they may find that an inch and a half, they need to leave and go to safer grounds. Hopefully these maps will help the public, as well as emergency management and other agencies and businesses, uh, better prepare for what could happen. It's important to understand that this rough cut map, um, it's, it's a snapshot. Uh, what we based it on was an inch and three quarters of rain in one hour in the burn scar. It, this um, is data that simulates a 10 year flood for this area, which basically means that in any given year, there's a 10% chance that this flood could occur. We assume because of all the debris that is coming out of the burn scar, that the culverts would be blocked unless it was a large uh, underpass uh, such as uh, that that is Highway 24 that crosses over Williams Canyon. That area, because it's such a large area, was not blocked. We also added an estimated depth level of the water. This water that you're going to see and is depicted on the maps as red, green, or yellow, uh, green being two feet or less, yellow being two to four feet, and red being uh, four feet or greater. And it's modeling the peak flow. Uh, that is not a consistent flow during the entire flood, but that is a peak flow uh, at some point during the flood itself. What we found that um, also is that it's good to understand that the flow of water that's depicted on this map is one example. Uh, rainstorms in this area can be much more or much less. And so this is just a snapshot in time of an inch and three quarters of rain. It's also based on the best modeling that we have available. Uh, and sometimes Mother Nature doesn't like our modeling, and so, but it's the best we could do. Well, you see in some of the maps, we have hard copy in the back and up here on the screen. For the most part in the Ute Pass down through Manitou, the, this flood, which is our 10% uh, chance in a year of occurring, stays generally within the 100-year floodplain. 
There are a few ex exceptions. Uh, one primary exception, which is North Douglas Creek, and Brett Waters will be discussing that uh, in detail when he comes up here. As you can see also on the map, CDOT will be challenged with keeping Highway 24 open. There are several areas that are, can be significantly impacted uh, by flooding uh, in, uh, off the burn scar. I would like to personally thank the Colorado Water Conservation Board who uh, provided the bulk of the funding for this project. In addition to funding, we also, also received from the Colorado Department of Emergency Management as well as regional building. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Brett Waters, and we'll follow with questions after he is done. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as we move through this, I want to be clear on not only what the study is, but also what we're doing about it. Um, as as uh, Patty Baxter mentioned, there is some areas that go outside of the floodplain, particularly North Douglas Creek, that impact residences as well as businesses. We understand, as was discussed earlier, this is preliminary but this is the best information that we have at this time. We also understand this is not a floodplain, and so we just want to make that sure that's clear. There's a couple things. Commissioner Clark mentioned a big one. We are working together uh, as a recovery group uh, that involves uh, many agencies to work together on uh, dealing with this because we are taking it very seriously. We have put uh, rain gauges in the burn scar to give us more notice on what's happening. We have worked um, evenings and weekends and even over last weekend to put this together. Um, and in a response setting, uh, we are working together on how we're going to respond to this. And we have work groups, uh, police, fire, uh, public works groups who are working together to deal, if this, uh, deal with this if this happens. Uh, the City of Colorado Springs has approved the use of $8.8 .8 million. Specifically, uh, let me address a couple of those areas. Uh, North and South Douglas Creeks channels will be reconstructed under design build contract. Camp Creek drainage area will be analyzed for potential uh, of a large detention basin upstream of Pleasant Valley. We've worked together again regionally uh, with emergency watershed protection and as many know, uh, we've worked through the winter on Flying W Ranch to uh, construct debris basins in that area to again lessen the debris that might come. Some of the results that you see are really due to block drainages, debris, and so we're working hard, uh, particularly in Flying W, uh, to uh, mitigate those effects of debris movement. And the other area, as you may be aware, is through the navigators. We've sponsored them and they put together two large debris uh, nets up there to lessen uh, debris and boulders coming down. We've also received a grant uh, above South Douglas Creek, uh, above the Autism Center, to do work uh, there as well. We are holding two meetings, particularly uh, to address North and South Douglas Creeks as it pertains to the study and answer questions. The first meeting is for residents and all those who are interested in, in talking about uh, the risks that we're talking about today. That'll be on June 4th, Tuesday, 6 to 8.30 at the Front Range Alliance Church. That's 5210 Centennial Boulevard. The second meeting will be Thursday, June 6th. This is for businesses as well as any residents who'd like to come. There's a bus route, and this is right here in El Paso County Service Center, room 1020, June 6th, 1 to 3 p.m. And so we want to address concerns that are out there, answer questions if we can, and we, what we want the study to do is empower individuals to make good decisions if and when a flood happens. Uh, we deliberately added depths uh, to this study so they can have some understanding of what they're looking at as far as depths with their residences or businesses. But we want to be clear that, again, this is preliminary. This is the best information that we have. And uh, we hope this will empower uh, individuals to really be aware of what the risks are. Um, if it hasn't been mentioned, let me mention that, that this map is available on El Paso County's website, uh, on the City of Colorado Springs website, springsgov.com. It's a very user-friendly site where you can go in, look at your address, look at what the results of the study are, and be informed on, what, uh, on, on what's happening. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Rose. At this point, it's really the opportunity for the media to ask questions. Uh, in the room, I, I started to uh, mention some of the folks who are here. 
Uh, I think maybe the best way for you to do, for us to start anyway, would be for you to uh, kind of ask a question, and we'll try to identify some folks that can answer it for you. Uh, I was remiss in, uh, in thanking my colleagues at the City of Colorado Springs. Kim Melchor is back there and Cindy Aubrey uh, were very helpful in putting this together. I uh, also appreciate uh, Under Sheriff uh, Paula Presley and uh, Joe Royball from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office joining us and uh, our friends from El Paso County uh, Public Health who have been uh, working alongside. Uh, flood flood uh, response will take many forms. Uh, Brett uh, referred and Patty referred to, uh, for example, public services. Uh, contracts are being let, city and county, uh, for the removal of debris. Uh, when debris comes down, it will, uh, it will contain with it uh, hazardous chemicals. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things to take into account in planning, and there's a lot of that planning in progress. So if we could uh, have any questions, let's see if we can bring up some of the ask experts. Uh, Andre Bracken is here from uh, County Engineering, Tim Mitros from City, and I'm sure they can uh, answer any questions that you've got. Law enforcement. Okay. Dave, maybe we yeah. can start by, could you repeat what you said earlier about the difference between flash flood and what people from maybe the East Coast or whatever are used to? Yeah, I think the, uh, the what, uh, and this was discovered uh, largely by folks going door to door, and there have been a lot of people going door to door. The city's had folks going door to door uh, over in the Pleasant Valley area, El Paso County Public Health had folks going door to door up in the Ute Pass area. And what they found when they talked flooding with people from the East Coast, uh, the Midwest, and the South uh, was that their understanding of flooding was what you see on the Mississippi River or the Missouri River. And that is that uh, they're able to predict that the flood will rise to uh, a crest above so many feet uh, next week. That won't happen here. That is a flood in the Midwest on these long meandering rivers. Uh, what will happen here is a flash flood. It may happen very, very quickly indeed. In 1976, uh, the flood in uh, Big Thompson Canyon uh, killed 143 people. Uh, there was uh, devastation to more than 400 homes up there, and that was a flash flood event of the type that could occur if you have that kind of rain. Uh, Patty mentioned that this model is an inch and three quarters. Uh, that was about two and a half inches in an hour over, uh, over Big Thompson. And then it didn't just last an hour. It continued for, for several hours. What, what are, if you could elaborate on Douglas Creek just a little bit, there seemed to be particular attention <clears throat> paid to that during your remarks, Fred. Um, what is, if you can get more specific on the concern for Douglas Creek specifically, and uh, uh, maybe the difference between north and south? Too. Sure. In, in um, both north and south, if you look at the maps, we encourage the public to do that. Is that um, many of the maps we've been looking at are an existing 100 year floodplain. And uh, the, the part of the study that goes outside of the floodplain is in North and South Douglas. So we pay close attention to that. Um, and as you see, as you look at these maps on North and South Douglas, uh, their residences and businesses impacted outside of the existing uh, floodplain that is, has been noted before. And so we pay, we note special attention to that just for residents to be aware of that, is that there are areas, fairly large areas that um, are are, are well outside um, normal floodplain boundaries. Again, this is not a floodplain, but that was the existing map that was available. And so with this study, uh, residences should be encouraged if they're close to North and South Douglas, even Garden of Gods area where Douglas goes across Garden of Gods <coughs> is a significant area where um, it, it widens out quite a bit. We encourage uh, those that may be impacted and those who are not to just to be aware of, of what the study uh, lays out. I don't know if you can uh, answer this in these terms because it's such a complex system it seems like, but if it rained over the entire burn scar, is there a place that would be more vulnerable than the other places? I think this is what this study is really trying to do with, with, with the depths um, is that, that that's a very good question. Um, 
I, I believe this is the best information we have with, as, as Patty Baxter talked about, um, what, what a 10% chance every year of this, of this happening uh, over the burn scar. This is what we think may be the result. I don't know if think, uh, Patty, you want to add to that. I think that this is, that's what we're trying to do in, essentially in this study. So. Well, yeah, this map does reflect 100. This map does reflect an inch and three quarters. And if you, and you can see it in the back and on, on the here, you can see there are some areas in, that are in the red or the, obviously at the highest risk. But I will need to caution that we only modeled it to the four foot level, four foot and above. Above could mean six feet, it could mean you know, 23 feet, we don't know at this time. Uh, more detail on, on water levels will be available at the detailed study. Where are the areas that are at highest risk? You can see on this map here, there's several areas that follow Fountain Creek. Um, Highway 24, there's a couple of areas that have significantly impact Highway 24. Manitou Springs, um, the business district, um, is at a great danger. Um, primarily, it's a confluence of Williams Canyon as well as Fountain. It does pose significant hazards for them. And if you want to address Douglas. And we can probably show on this map some other areas. Yeah, I'd encourage you to really evaluate the maps. I mean, one of the, the um, biggest considerations um, that we, we placed on this was depths. And so that should give some level of understanding for residents to say there's a difference between one to two feet and four feet and above. And so when we're, look at, when we're looking at planning and relocation of uh, when, when we make our individual and family plans and emergencies, that information we hope will be helpful so they can really address how they would react. Um, the biggest concern that we have has been, has been talked about, which is flash flooding occurs very, very quickly. Uh, and it, it, it occurs where there is a, a it may be dry, uh, in, in a matter of minutes, it, it is not. It is a, we have debris and boulders and things that can be very destructive. And flooding, flash flooding is a very, throughout the country has been a very deadly hazard that we've dealt with before. So I think we're bringing back some more information. So hope that answers your question. Yes. It's kind of a two-part question. Is there a, a mass evacuation plan for Manitou Springs uh, business district and the residents there? And second part, any sort of uh, public awareness campaign for tourists? Obviously, Manitou is a huge tourist mecca. They may not be aware. They could be washed away. Hi, I'm Joe Ribeiro, Chief of Police with Manitou Springs. Uh, the first question, the mass evacuation plan, our concern is that timing and quickness of something like this really doesn't allow for a mass evacuation. So the, the message is more about awareness. It is know your risk, pay attention to the weather. So residents and businesses, we hope to have constantly aware as the storm rolls in with the weather service forecasts and the warning systems that we have in place. We're also engaging our business community to help with our visitors. So hotels, beds and breakfast, businesses along the avenue, that they have developed their plan, and if action is necessary, that they share that plan, much like a fire marshal would in a school building or a flight attendant would on an aircraft. They're the trained people, and they help the untrained people in the situation. So we're asking our businesses to do that as well. Um, and I guess follow up for you, noticing it looking at the maps, the police and fire station are in that uh, aren't they? I hadn't noticed. My, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is, I'm sorry, I don't make, mean to make light of this. Actually, that's a very serious concern. Yes, it is. And part of our emergency plan does count for that. So, yes, we're very aware of it. And uh, it's my hope as the police chief that we don't remain in that floodplain for the long term. Uh, we, we are beginning efforts to, to look at opportunities to find better ways to continue our business. How much notice do you think a person could get in Manitou Springs? Well, my hope is that by paying attention to the weather forecast, uh, they'll have hours of notice. So as the weather forecast comes in, the watch is issued, the warning is issued, they'll respond to those watches and warnings and take the action in time that they're not in the way when the flash flood occurs. 
So that's my best hope. I think a real concern is that someone is not paying attention to the weather. We get a storm that comes over Williams Canyon where our alert systems are much less because there are no people inside Williams Canyon. We have to rely on technology and spotters in Williams Canyon. And my fear is we could have two or three minutes of warning when a flash flood reaches the populated areas of Williams Canyon and now we're trying to respond to that. So again, the, the severity of the storm affects the severity of the inundation. Uh, we're we're going to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. What are some of the ways you're going to be letting citizens know that it could be coming? Obviously, reverse 911. But you can send in other city in the city as well. They can send fire trucks and police cars up and down with full horns. And well, as it's safe to do, as as our individual responder safety will permit, we'll do everything we can to help people be aware. But our message is: pay attention to your weather radio. Pay attention to the television. Pay attention to radio. Attach yourself to that information and have your plan laid out. Your decisions are already made of what you're going to do when a certain threshold is reached. So what are you going to do when a wash is issued? What are you going to do when a warning is issued? And what are you going to do when Manitou's siren blows? So for, for us, we have thresholds for each of those decisions. Um, again, my hope is people won't be there when the flash flood comes. Our warning systems include encouraging people to listen to these messages. Uh, sort of the last ditch effort in Manitou Springs is our siren. And, and that is that if we can get to it, will issue the siren. So the siren um, is human dependent. It requires a push person to launch the siren. And where, where we have decided to use that right now is when flash flooding is occurring. And so I think this is an important uh, message for everyone to take. The Weather Service right now issues a flash flood warning when flash flooding is highly potential or is occurring. So there's a little bit of ambiguity to that message. So you'll get your NOAA weather radio when that warning is issued. Manitou Springs is taking one level higher. When we have confirmed that flash flooding is occurring, that's when we'll issue the siren. In terms of uh, public and media monitoring of what's happening at those rain gauges in, uh, that you got that are set up up there, Will there be public access to that data in real time and uh, for our meteorologists as well? Absolutely. We've, we've worked, with, I think, with all of your meteorologists. There are USGS gauges publicly facing. You can go on the website under USGS, and you have access to them right now. They're real time, and so you have that information as well. And so that's available to the public. Let me just add, if I could, to the previous question as well. Many, we do not want residents to uh, drive their vehicles into, into running water. And oftentimes in a, in a flash flooding event, relocation is your best method. Uh, not, not necessarily evacuation, particularly evacuation into running water or evacuation into your vehicle from, a high, from high ground to low lying areas. Many people uh, uh, actually uh, pass away, die in vehicles in flash flooding. And so this, is, this information should empower residents to be aware of where we think the water's going to go so they can make a plan. One of the things that you can do is to help us to communicate um, to make sure that they're, that residents are signed up for the, the E911 um, because register your cell phones, register your email, register your text ability. So that allows us to use the reverse 911 not just through a phone call, but also through texting and email, which is much faster to get a hold of folks. So they would just need to go onto the, um, to the El Paso Teller County E911 website and you can register that way. Um, the other thing I wanted to just um, mention too is to, um, to ask the media to be fairly sensitive to, this has been a really tough year. Last year we lost our entire summer tourism season because of the issues regarding Waldo Canyon and the fire itself. We don't want to continue to um, get behind the curve on that. On the other hand, we have to prepare our community to be responsible in order to be upfront. We, we don't want to hold back secrets and then be accused of not sharing information with folks. So it's, it's a double-edged sword of wanting to make sure that we have a successful season 
and that we recover economically while at the same time being prepared. So we don't know when the next storm is going to happen, but I certainly would ask our media to be sensitive to the fact that we want a good tourism season, but we also want to make sure that our residents are prepared. Sally, do you have any suggestions for us on how we do that? <laughs> if you have, you know, uh, certainly, I think just making sure that the residents and the business owners understand and have a plan in place. Because um, just like my business, I'm not necessarily in one of these areas that's going to be directly impacted. But um, in order to have those evacuation plans and to prepare your guests or your um, clients, your, your, your business, the folks that are, are in your businesses, um, your kids, your pets, what are you going to do just in case to be prepared in advance so that if someone's staying, for instance, in a hotel or bed and breakfast or is in a restaurant, to know when something happens to do the right thing and to have those evacuation plans in place. I don't think that we're going to, I mean, we, we really need to just be sensitive to that fact, but also we need to be very realistic that this may happen at any moment and we just don't know when that's going to be. It may not be for years or it may be next week. Um, everyone just needs to take personal responsibility, whether that's your home or whether that's your business. Brett has something else to add, and then, uh, and Jill, would you mind talking just a little bit about the, what will come down if we start having debris? Let me just uh, reemphasize um, that North and South Douglas Creek, there is new information here that, that is not on any map. Uh, today, you're going to have a new area that has not been any other map as far as the at-risk flood areas. We are sending out a invitation to all the residents in that area for these two meetings. However, we would love your cooperation in advertising these <coughs> meetings I referred to earlier so we can answer questions. But this is new information as opposed to most other areas in the study are, are, are within the existing floodplain and most are familiar with that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. That's a, that's a really important point. And uh, the, the North and South Douglas Creek uh, situation uh, it is a little different. Uh, when, we, when we counted the residents, uh, revealed the, the number of buildings that were revealed, uh, for example, all along uh, Ute Pass and Fountain Creek, relatively few that were not in the 100-year uh, floodplain have suddenly become in the 100-year floodplain. Uh, in North and South Douglas Creek, there are, are more structures like that, and it has to do with with draining structures back up and where does the water go when that happens. If we could just kind of wrap up, I'll ask Jill Law from El Paso County Public Health to come up and talk a little bit um, about uh, the, the kinds of things that, that will happen uh, if we do have a lot of this debris come down and we do have a flood situation. Uh, that will become an issue in terms of uh, water quality. Uh, we may have utilities out. There'll be a number of issues that, uh, that will have to be dealt with by public health. Absolutely, thank you. Hello, my name is Jill Law, Public Health Director, El Paso County Public Health. And actually, I'm just going to briefly touch on two different topics, one being personal preparedness, and that's messaging that we really need to work on today. We don't need to wait for a disaster to get some of these key messages out. Um, Dave touched on the fact that public health actually did a community assessment in partnership with um, the uh, City of Colorado Springs and El Paso County. And so we did actually go door to door and we spoke to 170 dis different households. The messaging that I really want to put out at this point in time is don't wait for a disaster to have certain preparedness on hand. One of the things that we found in that assessment is only 40% of the households have bottled water or backup water on hand. That's a very, very important key thing for all of us to have in the event of an emergency, in the event that you have water loss. The other piece that we really try to emphasize to individuals is what is actually their communication plan with their family. It's very, very important that families make that communication plan so they are able to locate their children, locate their, maybe their elderly parents. What will you do with your pet? Um, many of these households actually have pets. That was very, very a common factor. One of the things that we're really working with is our partners to have shelters that are pet friendly because that was something that we learned in the actual fire. Individuals were really challenged that had animals 
as to where they could actually relocate to and take their pets with them. So those are some key messaging. The other piece is don't wait until an emergency to get a tetanus booster. One of the work plans is related to debris removal. Anytime any of us have a disaster in our home, what is the first thing we want to do when we're able to go back? We want to look at our home. We want to see what's left. We want to pick through what we might still have. It's very important that you get a tetanus booster ahead of time. Tetanus is a real risk after any kind of disaster. So I would highly recommend individuals that do work, that also may be homeowners, that may be going through the debris removal, to do that now. Don't wait for the disaster to hit. Go ahead and look at talking to your doctor about getting that boosted ahead of time. Um, certainly we offer that through the health department, your local physician's offices, many pharmacies, grocery stores. You can reach out and get that now. I would highly recommend that. Some other details that I think are very important is, of course, the health department will be working on a business basis because remind yourselves, if restaurants have to be closed for days on end, say for example, they have a loss of power, they may have a loss of food supplies. So our environmental health department is on a work group. Um, unfortunately, we did learn a lot of lessons last year. We had to go into many businesses and help them in that recovery process so they could open back up and be a business again. It is a huge undertaking, but I think it's very important that we all think about this because in the event of a power loss, you may have food loss, uh, lots and lots of waste that has to be gotten rid of. And so there were, there's work groups currently dealing with that and planning for that uh, at this time. Thanks, Joe. You bet. It's just uh, in, in closing, I think it's, it's important for all of us to remember, uh, you know, uh, Florida has hurricanes, California has earthquakes. Uh, that doesn't prevent us from going to Disneyland and Disney World. You just have to have a plan, know how to deal with these things. We now have a flood risk, so we'll have to have our plans and know how to deal with, with these things. Are there any other questions that we can answer? Just one about, is there a specific message about up instead of out when, when evacuating? Higher ground versus you know, moving downstream, or is it a case-by-case -case basis depending on where you live? Or In general, <laughs> it's going to be up, not out. Now, I say that because in Manitou Springs, you could, for example, try to go up from Manitou Avenue and actually go up into the mouth of Williams Canyon, which probably would not be a very good plan. So you need to know where you are and what works best for you. One of the other things that we have discovered in talking with folks is that their, sort of their, their, their instinct may be wrong. Uh, for example, if you uh, live on the south side of Fountain Creek in the Green Mountain Falls area, your instinct may be to rush over and get your child at, at the elementary school. That would be wrong. Uh, the, the child could well be evacuated from the elementary school and be very safe. You could well stay home and be very safe, and the act of driving across Fountain Creek to go there would not be safe. So it's important to develop a personal plan that works for you. Likewise in Manitou Springs, you could uh, well be safe along Manitou Avenue and make the decision to cross the creek to go over to the parking lot and pick up your car, and this might not be a very good decision. So it's important to, to base it very, very personally. Yeah. And I know, I know you all have covered this in the past, but um, with the emergency watershed protection money that we're getting uh, from the Natural Resources Conservation Service and our CS, um, we're, what we're working on is our priorities with the, the war study, the watershed assessment study, is really prioritizing those projects that will slow the water down. Um, we're mainly, we're working with CUSP, Teresa's here from Coalition for the Upper South Flat. We're working with all the various agencies, as was kind of talked about in our regional uh, working group. And so that's going to help. It's not going to eliminate the problem, but as... Um, uh, really, a lot of these folks have already been in the floodplain. Not everyone, but a lot of them have. Now you need to be more prepared while you're in the floodplain because we have increased risk of, of higher flooding. Um, but I think the, the Forest Service is, is hopefully, Steve Sanchez is here from U.S. Forest Service as well. They're looking at about $1.2 million more this year 
based on allocations to work up above where all this flooding may occur. And so those are all components that we're pulling together on and trying to address. And the county is also putting a million dollars aside to use for emergencies as well so that we can address some of these issues as they come about. So we can just keep our fingers crossed and, and be as prepared as possible. I think that's the overall message. Is, uh, did Matrix consider the war study? In, in point of fact, I believe most of their data, I believe this is largely an analysis of data from, from wars, isn't it? No, for the, um, for the rough cut, uh, most of their data come, came from the Bear Report. For the detailed study, I'm, I'm certain they will be considering using the wars assessment and data from it. Uh, we're just, uh, we finished the rock cut, uh, next meeting with Matrix, we'll be starting to get into the details for the detailed study. Okay, any other questions? Well, again, thank you so much uh, for coming and for uh, all of the great work you've, uh, you've done in making citizens aware. We really appreciate it. El Paso County Works is aired on the Pikes Peak Library District channel at 10 p.m. on the second and fourth Friday of each month. If you have suggestions for future program topics, please contact Jennifer Brown at jenniferbrown at elpasoco.com or call 238-4478. Hello, I'm El Paso County Commissioner Darrell Glenn. The Waldo Canyon burn scar doesn't absorb water like unburned ground, so our community now faces a serious threat from flash flooding. County and city websites offer information to help you determine the risk and locate places of safety in your area. Some will be shelter in place, others will need to move to higher ground, so it's important to have a plan. Emergency preparedness starts with you.